Hi, this is Pillier. I'd like to discuss a series of books titled Capitalism and Schizophrenia, and this will act as an introduction to the works. So what is it? It is a two-volume work by French academic Gilles Deleuze and activist Felix Guitari. Both books can be read as separate works, but tie into one thesis that capitalism is bad. Okay? The first book is anti Oedipus, which came out in 1972, and the second book is A Thousand Plateaus, which came out eight years later. It's not really a series, but a convenient term applied to the books after the lease of A Thousand Plateaus. Well, in the original French, it was titled that in the first work, but then later became a series name. These two books are relevant in French culture, but English translations stir up more controversy, because you can really only enjoy this book in its original French. The books have become popular among both postmodern and Marxist elitists. However, the works have been known to popularize a lowbrow dialogue of elite concepts, making philosophy more fun and enjoyable for the upper middle class. Think of Christian Lander's book Stuff White People Like and the work of Slavjov Zizek, you know, saying that uh, Justin Bieber is the patriarchy and kind of goofy things like that. So who is this Deleuze? Gilles Deleuze is a French philosopher and academic known for his work about Nietzsche, Hegel, and Hume. He was an atheist and a centrist liberal, neither left or right, so he claims to be. He was a professional obsessed with the academic hobby of finding the truth and continuing the Western canon after Heidegger. He realized that most of his philosophy that he had discovered was based around a concept called eminence. To him, eminence is a thought environment that, to explain sophisticated, complicated philosophies, one must create a concept based around it, and then attach it all together like a spider web. Think of my own ideals like Asian Arianism, or the one I found, Homo Nationalism, or the popular alt-right term, Cuxervative. These are a part of this big spider web and explain things which are going on. Using this logic, Deleuze saw this as the only way to explain difficult subjects. He applied this to early academic works and contributed this to academia with his strong criticism against analytic philosophy, and as usually the works of Bachard Russell and Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. He was previously known as a normal Joe Schmo professional academic without a name, and he later became famous for his association with the controversial Felix Guitari and becoming a bestseller in France. The middle class bought his anti Oedipus book as well, selling over 70,000 copies. And you may now ask, who is this Guattari? Felix Guattari was an autodidactic trained in psychoanalysis. He was a hard-left Trotskyite and often criticized higher education. Especially him and Deleuze was a part of the University of Par Paris, which is probably the highest academia in the world. And then he dropped out and transferred often with no real devotion to a particular program. He was an acti activist into Marxism, closely associated with the student protest culture and hippie movement. Guattari saw the exploitation of mentally ill patients and the middle class being prescribed names out of the normative. He felt something was wrong with the entire discipline of psychoanalysis. Think of Hans Osberger, who labeled those with one little problem from the norm. And you have to remember something that Hans Osberger, the man who coined Asperger syndrome, was a eugenicist and believed that there were pure people out of best genetic qualities and this will make a sensitive person angry. Vitari was into the high arts, but tried to educate those in lowbrow culture, since he was so invested in protest and the student youth revolt uprising. Now He met Deleuze after a major student uprising in France, and they both wanted to explain what exactly was happening in a popular format. So you have to understand something, what was French academia, academia was like? Um, I'm not French myself, 
So you have to understand that French academia was associated with the bourgeois class. This class was elitist. No one can enter it, and only those born into royalty can be bourgeois. And the irony is that Deleuze and Guattari came from conservative and rich families. The modernist school of thinking was for, and only for, the aristocratic elite. It was really different a hundred years ago. We don't have that today. And so you have to think in terms of this way that class structure was especially real in this European country. The modernists had to know a peculiar language about logic and facts in order to create new arguments and to solve concerning issues about society. You know, it was kind of up to the bourgeois to save society, even though the bourgeois would enjoy everyday life by doing absolutely nothing but materialism. So the postmodernists were raging against the strict, the strict and annoying practice that the modernists were practicing. To infiltrate the aging modernist in power, the postmodernists played as modernists in order to change academia, hence why they're called postmodernists. Deleuze could speak the modernist language, and Guattari was too lowbrow to confront the modernists. In other words, Deleuze acted as a ventriloquist for Guattari. Deleuze, Deleuze had the, the means and language and the philosophical discipline, and Guattari had the angry voice, which didn't even get across the modernists. So it was a perfect duo for that. And to mention, Jean Bourgevard saw this as a problem with high culture and modernism, written in 1965 about modern uh, academic language. So often, capitalism and schizophrenia is cited as fashionable nonsense, and it's true. In the book Fashionable Nonsense, released in 1997, Alain Sokol and Jean Brickmont, uh, 20 years later, are able to pick away the fad uh, Deleuze and Guattari made up. Another book, Higher Superstition, released in 94 by Paul R. Gross and Norman Leavitt, Levitt, are able to explain from a leftist perspective why this modernist jargon has gone too far, even for a no normal, God-loving leftist. So even the political left that wants to do left-wing causes, uh, you know, in the 90s, you had to be this super smart, big brain nibba in order to do all this left-wing things, and it was just really annoying. But after reading these books, you will understand the language that Deleuze and Guattari present in Capitalism and Schizophrenia. As previously mentioned, eminence is about creating concepts and then making philosophy based around them, whether they start using Asian Arianism or homo nationalism. Uh, I would recommend another book, The Dictionary of Fashionable Nonsense, A Guide for Edgy People, uh, which will describe a lot of this. And you make a think that this hipster preening dumb, is, it's true, and it becomes like that. And you have to understand it's also a language game. Now, as much as Deleuze wants to bash on the analytic school of thinking, it was popular during his time. You have to fight back his continental philosophy, that is Western philosophy about the social and feelings over objective troops, with more analytics, really. Now, I recommend Language, Saucer, and Wittgenstein, How to Play Games with Words by Roy Harris, which came out in 1988, a few years after the Thousand Plateaus. By understanding several capitalism and schizophrenic eminence concepts, you can grasp what Guattari wants over Deleuze. As said before, Deleuze is only the translator. Guattari is the substance. Both are having fun talking about ideals back and forth like a fun ping pong game. So I would recommend to enjoy capitalism and schizophrenia as a work of poetry as something you can read without start to finish, but read any chapter you want and understanding one concept at a time. Deleuze and Guattari uh, playfully cite H.P. Lovecraft and Frank Herbert's Dune as relative as hardcore philosophical concepts. They even said that there's no agenda to the book, other than that what the modernist and elitist reader can get from it. So you might ask, why is it still popular among academics and elitists, then, if it was actually meant to criticize the modernist elitists? Again, this goes with why we have to understand French bourgeois people and something about the 1960s. 
It was the end of the 60s, nobody had the internet, and life was cis, normative, and boring. A lot of the theories presented in Capitalism and Schizophrenia are made up to explain something about both uh, Deleuze, Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari felt was meaningful to discuss. Why is protest happening? Why do young people want, what, you know, what, what do young people want and old French people don't get? All right? A lot of the original material was from Guattari, and Deleuze helped expand it upon it with his knowledge of the language game of philosophy and his concepts, concepts of eminence. Thinking anything was possible was cutting edge for boomers. Getting high was the craze to see new realities. Reading Capitalism and Schizophrenia is a way to get high without drugs. So the book is great for the artist or creative writer. It's a way for the autistic academic who took all previous philosophy serious and then get metapolitical thoughts of Guattari's activism for the closed-minded bourgeois class. Still to this day, serious philosopher academics think Deleuze is a god among men, and Jordan B. Peterson and Roger Scruton have been able to call out these imposters. So it's very difficult. It's something very cultural, generational, and uh, millennials won't be able to understand this. And so it's good to know about the French bourgeois class and this ideal of the avant-garde with, among the French. So to look further into the books, Antiodipus, the, the first book, it, it, was, it, was, it was not just written for modern academics, academia, but as well as published for the French masses in paperback, as it sold 70,000 copies. It shared both a modernist and lowbrow tone for the agitated French reader upset with modernism in academia. The lowbrow tone is influenced by Louise Fernard Céline, often cursing out authoritative figures. I think this is a French tradition when writing for the middle class. You just say curse words like fuck and shit in the French, and it shows their anger. And this definitely makes it lowbrow. It's a, there's a theme in it about desire and how desire ends up oppressing us than we controlling it. Has Foucault written the preference, later on, to paraphrase, fascism is a virus. You know, anybody can catch fascism like HIV. And this is, might be what Galoos and Guattari get at. Tons of new concepts are thrown at the reader while modernists are already supposed to know what Deleuze is citing and as well new concepts Dakari is throwing at them. And this makes the book even more uh, creative than ever, and something of a phenomenon. Again, the most mundane things, from popular things to modernist history, are hodgepodge together. And it's a reason why the work is cited as eclectic postmodernism. This is because both the writers feel a need to express their written word as an art more than anything. There could be no revolution because we love our desire to consume. It is anti-opitus because Guattari wants a new school of thinking against our own doom of consent. Anti-opitus. <laughs> Sorry. Like if you've read, you know, he kills his father, has sex with his mother, and consents to this doom by taking out his eyes. It's the same thing when we consent within a capitalist system. But mainly, just think about eclectic postmodernism and how this issue is set across and what is to be done, you know, that you knowing knowing that capitalism is bad and the psychoanalysis hands Osberger market, we tend to understand this through this kind of, again, lowbrow, eclectic, all these things going at once and introducing all these new themes by Deleuze language and Guattari activism. And later on, after eight years later, we have A Thousand Plateaus. Now, to briefly mention in this book, it was released as extended footnotes, or B-sides you might hear on a single or a record, of writing of the Luz and Guattari written together. You know, kind of like creative writing, creative writing write, um, sessions. The first book is about their anger, Antiodipus, and this one... And that had an important thesis. And this book, the reader has to find meaning in it, and is considered more as creative writing. You know, after this book, it was tied together as a sequel to Anti-Opitus, 
thus belonging in the same volume, though the work should stand on its own. A plateau could be translated as a joke, used to refer as just an axiom, kind of like the new science by uh, uh, Bastovico, I'm thinking, or as a wordplay about new concepts introduced or about society itself. So again, a plateau can be many things, and it's kind of a joke in itself, very parody. Again, at this point, the text can be enjoyed as a pleasure read that will be only be enjoyed for those modernists, which are the postmodernists, that are artistic and want to read something playful by using their own thoughts into the discord, the discourse. When I picked up this book, you know, they were talking about William Burroughs' cut-up approach, right? And they were talking about music. And again, here's the eclectic nature. You can really only enjoy this if you know this prior, but then it ends up becoming a pleasure read. So I think A Thousand Plateaus is kind of the underrated gem, or the more reading of it to really get what this language is all about. But uh, sadly, these works are advocated by the far left. The concept of spaces, you know, created the real cooling safe spaces. I mean, as much as Deleuze and Guattari want spaces away from capitalism and without desire, we end up creating safe spaces that are a part of society and make things worse. It's not that they created safe spaces or Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. They were just talking about it in dialogue. It's very pretentious. And think, Antifa wants a revolution without capitalism but buys into hardcore punk culture and hot topic clothing. How can you have that? You become a consumer of its own. And one concept I believe introduced in A Thousand Plateaus, a rhyme zone, is a nice way of saying, I hate logical automatism. There can, there can, there can be such a thing as a black other kin lesbo female anime riot girl with blue hair. Or a nice way of saying egalitarianism while the philosophers play dumb to it. And so all this pretty language just makes it seem like it's justifying all the SJW madness we're seeing in 2018. And then you must ask, when can it do justice in the far right? I have came across Mark Dial's piece on countercurrents and in North American New Right Volume 2, which I recommend reading. But I don't see it advocated everywhere else, anywhere else. Again, Dial himself is an ex-leftist, he was into black studies, and he's into breakcore and digital hardcore music, so it adds to being more I'm artsy fartsy, queer, you know, he's a queer, compared to Harpa Derpa Trad Chad of uh, Matthew Heinbach. But um, I think I, I said a lot, but I, I will end this hoping you will read the work yourself, and uh, I will then put this YouTube comment as when I was looking up rhyme zone, three minute theory, what is a rhyme zone? Uh, a YouTube commenter had 23 upvotes and it was the highest uh, upvote. And I think this is a really good way to express what is being read. So, cavit emptor, or buyer beware. And I'll read this quote I'm sorry, but this makes no sense whatsoever. Not because it is a poor explanation, but because there's no substance to the stupid ideal of a rhyme zone in philosophy, or much of anything in the thought of Deleuze, Guattari, or other French postmodernist philosophers. It's all just garbage dressed up in imprint imprintable bibberage, and everyone thinks the ideals are so massive and complex that we couldn't possibly understand them. But actually, it's just amenable words with no meaning or substance, where Deleuze and Guattari have dipped into science and mathematics, which other people actually know a thing or two about, and which has fixed concepts. They have been exposed as the charlatans that they are. People should read fashionable nonsense, postmodern intellectuals abuse of science by Brickman and Skokel. And that was by YouTube commenter uh, Sam Oldham from the video Three Minute Theory, What is the Rhyme Zone? But if that's the top comment by 23 votes, this is what everyone thinks about Galoose and Guattari. And I have to agree. Um, it's whether we have to treat this work as a work of art and not as high leftist rhetoric or leftist academic rhetoric. 
you know, being only for the French bourgeois. But maybe we could treat the work in a way to explain other things and maybe destroy an Achilles heel and maybe easily use another meta politics to stop what else is going on. Maybe I'm just saying, how about let's use some capitalism schizophrenia language in order to continue, you know, artistic desire and maybe look at that a bit. But again, this, maybe I'm just talking about hipsters and pranksters who I see on an often daily basis. Thanks for listening. www.pilleater.com